And um, let me put the glasses on and get into this a little bit better. There we go. I look so official. <laughs> I haven't really got used to the looking up and the looking down. Uh, I can read my iPad fine, but when it comes to the regular small letters, it kind of gets me so. Now, I found that this, this chapter had so many uh, interesting things in it. We're going to kind of camp out on a few of them because of the fact that Jesus talked about their importance to us here in the fourth chapter. Oh, and before I forget, go Jags, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, got, they got their chance to prove their worth going forward. So uh, yeah. today's the day. Today's the day. We prayed last week that, uh, right. that they wouldn't get all injured. So I'd be willing to extend my faith that to that prayer, yeah. today. That prayer was answered. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, some people are like, well, we're going to pray that they win. Uh, you know, everybody did their work in the most deserving, may the most deserving person win, but uh, we sure don't want to see anybody get injured along the way. So, Father God, we do pray for our team and our, our home team, asking God that you continue to protect and preserve them, give them wisdom on how to how to conduct their uh, their games so that uh, all the people are able to do their best without getting hurt in the process of Jesus. Name. Amen. And uh, sometimes I, I, had, I had, when I was in, in uh, in Gainesville, one of the coaches' children came, well, they, they came to church too, but the kids asked me a question. He had to do some some uh, some public service time, so he ended up at the office a lot more than he probably wanted to be. So uh, so he says, I always got a question. I said, what's that? He said, um, now, uh, if there's a Christian on, on one team praying they win, and, and, and I'm on the other team as a Christian praying that we win, he goes, how does God decide who wins? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I, I think it comes down to, to preparation and, you know, did you execute? Did you, did you uh, prepare well? And, uh, and uh, I think that, that that says a lot more about what the outcome will be than just, you know, the prayer. So uh, he, 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 he thought that made good sense. Uh, and then he became the quarterback for the Gamecocks. So. Uh, I don't know what that says, yeah. but uh, he, he took it and went with it. Let's go ahead and look at the fourth chapter together, and uh, I'm reading from the King James 2000, which is basically just a, a new King James. It doesn't really do anything much different than the new King James. It's just simply a little, little more updated. Uh, but if we start in the first verse, it says, uh, And he began to teach by the seaside, and there gathered in great multitude. So he entered into the ship, and he sat, and he taught them in parables. And uh, I'm skipping, you know, just a few of the words just to get to the ones of importance here. And these, uh, we're going to really pick it up in the uh, third verse as we start talking about this parable. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the seed and so? And so this is kind of uh, uh, something that we've all heard. And I have read as much commentary as I care to read about this and, <laughs> and heard so many good and bad things, I don't want to just regurgitate them all to you. But um, I want to take what, what I believe is good for us and leave the rest behind. So let's read the parable real quick, and then we'll start to see what Jesus says about the parable. Uh, we don't always get the insight that he gives on this particular parable, so let's take it and, and, uh, and get some good stuff out of it. All right, listen, behold, there went out a sword to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And uh, some fell on stony ground, where there's not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it did not have no depth of earth. And uh, when the sun came up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it out, and yielded no fruit. And others fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit, and sprang up, and increased and brought forth some thirty, sixty, and a hundred. And he said unto them, He that has ears, let him hear. Okay, so that's pretty much the parable. I know I read it quickly, but thank God that's because I have glasses. Uh, <laughs> but you've heard me read without them like, because I can't make out the words. But thankfully, we're, we've read that parable, and if it wasn't for Jesus sitting down and kind of gathering his, 
his uh, innermost to himself and then giving us some insight into this we might have to be left to interpretation. But I think he, he spells it out pretty clearly and yet there still are some very keen points that we want to, uh, to camp on here. He said unto them in verse 13, Do you know this parable? How then will you know all parables? Now, I can't say emphatically that that means that this particular parable will be the key to unlocking all parables, but it obviously has some principles in it that might help you to be able to understand many of the other things that Jesus is spoke, speaking about in parable form. So I think it's important that we grab this, this because Jesus himself said it's kind of a principled parable that will help us with others. And then he begins to explain it. He said, the sower sows the word. And these are they which are by the wayside. When the word is sown, when they've heard it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that is sown in their hearts. Now, it's important to recognize that in all these things, the word has been sown, and it actually says right here that they have heard the word, and it has entered and is now being sown in their hearts. But immediately, the devil comes and takes it away. Now, among those many things that I've we had read about, uh, there were cautions against it being four different kinds of Christians. Cautions against it being four different kinds of Christians. And, um, you know, I'm just putting that out there because as I see it, I see some things that uh, maybe each and every one of us in a progressive life experience with Christ will encounter a lot of these things. And maybe there was a time in your life where where Satan did come, and immediately you heard the word, and it didn't do you any good. I can give examples. When I was a kid, my mother had mental illness all of my adult life. I don't know whether she had it before I came along, but after I, I say after, uh, in my adult life, even as a child, you know, as since I can recall, she, she had that. And, and so the ambulance would be in front of my house uh, to come and address her, her suicidal tendencies regularly. So much so that if the ambulance was in front of my house, I really just didn't pay any attention because it was just too common. So the neighbor all, but the neighbor would take special note that there must have been a crisis. So they came and they 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 kind of bombarded me with with uh, with Jesus, you know. And they were like, "Oh, we're so sorry for you. Would, would would you like us to pray for you? And 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 would you pray this prayer with us?" And I, so I, you know, I'm just a kid. I'm like, "Okay, I'll do it with that, sure," you know. I prayed that prayer, and I, I, you know, I was the same, same the next day as it was the next week and the next month, you know, and and and, and again, I, I wanted this 260Z. I don't know if you follow Z. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, the 240, I say kid, when I was a teenager, 240Z was the hottest ticket around, minus the Porsche or something that was out of reach for the common man. So the 240 was the common man sports car, and that was the thing I wanted to have. So as soon as I could, I bought one. Now, my parents, on the other hand, said, you can't have a car, which didn't suit me real well because I wanted a car. And I didn't just want a car. I wanted the car I wanted. So I bought it without their knowledge. Now, I know your children would never do anything like that. But I bought the car without my parents' knowledge, and I stored it at my grandmother's house. But <laughs> wow, <laughs> resourceful is that. You can give me that. I was resourceful. Uh, but... I remember that when I went to buy this car, I had to buy it on, on time, you know, I'll give you $100 here and $100 there, you know. And this guy says, well, uh, you can't have the car, uh, but I'll sell you the car. I, we'll write up a contract, and, and when the contract's finished, you know, when you pay for it fully, then I'll give you the title and you'll own the car. I thought, okay, that's good. And uh, he goes, by the way, you know, could we tell you about Jesus? Sure. You're, you own the car, you can tell me about Jesus. I, mean, I got nothing, I want that car. And so he told me about Jesus. He and his, his girlfriend, they led me to Christ. No. Absolutely not. I mean, I just, I just wanted the car. I just said anything, you know, re recite the days of the calendar. That had been fine with me. I did whatever they wanted me to do so I could get the car. So, uh, third time, you know, this is this is throughout my life. See, you, you look at me today and you're like, oh yeah, the first time stuck. No, the first time didn't stick. The second time didn't stick. And then there was a there's a third time. This guy, again, involved around cars. I don't know why. But uh, after I wrecked that car that I bought from him, 
<laughs> then I went to buy another car, which was a Camaro. You know that car in Papa John's? It's all gold now. That that I had that car, but it wasn't gold. It was white with a blue stripe instead of gold with a black stripe. So anyway, now they got a metal picture. That's the kind of that's the car I had. But again, I couldn't pay for it right up because I just wrecked my other car that I finished paying for and spruced up and then wrecked. So he says, okay, you can buy that car, it cost you $700 down, and then you pay me $100 a week or, or a month or whatever it was. I don't know. And uh, so, but before I could buy that car, his son says, I got a video I want you to watch. <laughs> So I watched the video. I watched the whole thing. If you're familiar with old time, re, you know, gospel outreach videos, it was the cross and the switchblade. He shows me the cross and the switchblade, you know, with the Eric Estrada, you know. And so I, uh, I watched the whole thing, and at my house, in my comfort zone, I watched that whole thing because he stuck it in my video player, and he says, so what do you think? I said, about what? He goes, the video. I said, I don't know. What do you want me to think? I don't understand. I don't know how many times I could be presented with the gospel through so many different mechanisms and means. <laughs> Nothing stuck. So there's plenty of times in life where, you know, just because you may consider yourself any of these soils at some point in life, I think the soil changes. I was definitely that soil at the beginning of life. Were you? Mm -hmm. Did you have plenty of opportunities and turned away from those opportunities the devil took from you, the word that was sown? It was placed there before you, but you didn't grasp onto it, take it in, and start living the life. You just kind of went on about your own. Maybe it's just me. Probably it happened to you too. So I don't believe that... Uh, 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 that that Jesus is saying there are four kinds of Christians. I think there are, in this case, there are four examples of how people react to the word. Okay? Not that you're always any one of these forever for the rest of your life. But there's different ways that people react when the word is sown. I reacted that way at that time. I don't react that way now. I, act, I react other ways. So let's look at this as four ways that people react to the word. Okay? So let's get back to, uh, to what he said here. That was the first round. How many of you have ever experienced that first round of your in some point in your life? Satan stole the word from you. And I don't necessarily mean it's just about whether it's salvation, although that's the most important of the words. Sometimes somebody brings to you a nugget of new revelation about your relationship with Christ. And at first you're like, I don't know, I don't think that's for me. You know? And then uh, here you are today, and it's, you're all about it. You're like, oh yeah, I'm all in. Healing? I'm all in. You know, but you know, somebody maybe the first time they present it to you, you're like, I don't know, you know? Or, or any of the, you know, the things that, that happen post new birth. Amen? So sometimes we're back to that place again where we're like, eh, I don't know about that. You know, the devil comes with that unbelief and then that thing's gone until somebody else imparts another sowing of the word into our life. All right, so uh, he comes immediately and takes a word that was sown in the heart. And these they are, I'm in verse 16 if you're following me, and these are they likewise who are sown in stony ground, who have heard the word and immediately receive it with gladness. I like that. I, these are people I meet often. They're like, I am so happy to hear you know, from you. And thank you for sharing that with me. And then you're like, well, would you like to come to church? I don't go to church. You know, and not that banking going to church. It's just like, is there more? Do you go any further than just the happy, glad, you know, receiving? Yeah, I'm so happy. You know, I'm, that's wonderful. But look what happens to the happy hearer, what I'll call the happy hearer. Look what happens to the happy hearer. It says, likewise, when they've heard, they receive it with gladness, but they don't have any room in themselves, so they endure but for a time. And afterwards, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, they are immediately offended. How many have seen that happen? You're like, 
oh, I share with you Christ, and they're like, oh, I'm so happy to receive Christ, or I'm just, because basically, it doesn't mean just that, you know, we're talking about salvation, we're talking about salvation and everything that happens thereafter, so when I say it's just, you know, the first thing is salvation, but there's also incremental sowings into our lives that we can, we can also have these challenges with, but First of all, salvation, and so a lot of times people are like, yeah, I'm happy to be saved and everything, I'm happy to receive the word. But then somebody calls them down, out for the faith that they profess. They say, well, I, you know, to you, they'll say, I've received Christ. To somebody else, when they are asked, they want, might just say, I prefer not to answer. Or, you know, I don't have anything to say about that. The persecution starts. In other words, just some challenge that causes them to reevaluate whether or not that commitment is worth professing. In other words, I'm going to have to. I'm, uh, oh, there's really something expected. You know, I, I, you mean I'm going to be challenged in my faith? Well, yes. yes. That's 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 part of the experience. There's going to be challenge. I don't, I don't care whether it's just whether you're a Christian or whether you believe in, in, in one other aspect of the word sown into your life. Whether it's, what if you believe that God is your provider? Do you know how many people will hound you when you start professing that God is your provider? What if you want to be a tither? As soon as you start stepping out on that word, somebody will tell you that's nonsense and stupid. You're nothing more than just a, just a pawn being used by the religious hierarchy to create some man's kingdom, you know? It goes wild. This is all part of that persecution for the word's sake. Just as, first it's for Christ, the word, but then it can be for any aspect of your Christian experience that pushes you into a further dimension with God. Amen? Amen. So here, when you get pushback, when something is now pushing back against that happy hearer, they tend not to have the depth to take the pushback. And instead, they give in and give up. Now, all of these things, all of these times, kinds of ground can, can recirculate in your life from time to time. I remember when I first got born again, you couldn't talk me out of certain things. Then after a while, you were like, I began to question them. Then I came back around, you know? Yes. You know? And you, you come back around because you're, you're, you know, you make a decision to stand against. You, you draw a line in the sand and you say, okay, I, I believe this word above the circumstances. And this is what we're going to start learning is how the kingdom works like this. All right, but I, but I want to get through the grounds first before I get to what Jesus said next, obviously. So, they don't have any root. And it says, so when affliction and persecution arises, and listen to this, mine says, perhaps yours does too, says, for the word's sake. In other words, all this is done because that we have now received the word. And once we receive the word, any one of these things can happen along the way of your retention of the Word of God to try and make you, to either shake you from it or give it up or to replace it with something else. We haven't got to the replacement part. That's one of the next ones. So he goes on to say, and these are they which are sown among the thorns. They hear the Word too. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in, and they choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So this is different. This is more of a person who, it, put it this way, they've received the word, and they are the people who do have some root, because the other people didn't have any root. These people have extended themselves. They've put some root down, but then there's competition. Okay? How many have ever experienced competition for the word? Amen. What about when you start, you know, believing God as your provider and so forth, and then you have competition for that. You see that things are tight, that your finances are a little tighter than you thought they would be if God was your provider. You know, then you start to wonder, well, is it God my provider, or should I get three jobs? You know, <laughs> and you, you, you start to allow this competition for the word, so that in, in essence, you begin to make a choice. 
And that choice is, I'm going to lean towards my own understanding. I'm going to do things the way I know to do them, how I can do them. I can control the circumstances and the situations. And we'll let God do what God does, but I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going to worry and I'm going to yeah. work. Yes. You know? Those are the things to provide for my family and so forth. You know, I'm going to do the two things I do best. I'm going to worry and I'm going to work. Okay? <laughs> so that is the person. That is the, the evolving Christian experience that's not evolving in the right direction. You know, that's where the word comes in. But it's being challenged now. And we got, we, we're okay with the challenge. But now we start to replace the word with something that we value. We, at least we hear it first and hear the word second. Okay? Now, again, I don't want to give that away because Jesus kind of talks about it in just a minute. And then he says, so, so the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, how many have seen where things that, 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 uh, that preoccupy our time, you know, I, I'm, no present company is included or excluded in the statement, but I mean, when your kids start going like this, you know, it just brings chaos into your personal life, you know, and then it just, it, it starts your world to rock, you know, and all these things, these, these happen throughout life, you know, or, or, or some sicknesses. I mean, they can throw you for a wild loop, you know, and suddenly, you know, your finances are good, everything's going well, and some, you know, you get a diagnosis that's very bad, and then suddenly your finances get shot because of that, and then your, your personal, you know, health is shot. All these things get taken, and you start questioning who's our source? What are we going to trust? Whose word are we going to Accept. Amen? Yeah. And it doesn't mean we're going to exclude everything that is natural to only hold fast to things that are spiritual. But we should never replace the spiritual with exclusively with the natural. Never. Because we are born again. That is, that is, that is going backwards. Alright, so. And, and the desire for stuff. I mean, how many, how many people have you seen go through life? I mean, even the scriptures are full of examples of, you know, Paul's compadres who, you know, say, well, they love, Demas love the world more than, the, you know, more than anything else, so he's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it happens that, that people just fall in love with the things of the world. And in that, you know, like Jesus said, can't serve two masters. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, hold fast to one, let go of the other, you know. So it's just a principle can't have two masters, and sometimes people make the wrong choice. The beautiful thing is, again, that I do not believe that these are hard, set, fast, one time, all is for all grounds. That people change. Let me tell you, let me show you some of that in just a minute. But first of all, before we do, we got to get to the other and last part of the grounds here. And uh, let's pick that up in verse 20. And these that are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. I spent way too much time, I will be honest with you, spent way too much time trying to find any connection between 30, 60, and 100 fold in any way, mm. through anything that I found in other scriptures or anything. Some of it was so convoluted and strange that I immediately discounted it. It would take a semi-professing uh, genius to understand it. And even then, I would think it was not probably accurate. But put it this way, 30, 60, 100 fold, in my, in my opinion of this, because I believe that these grounds are, are in flux. In other words, if you have tears in your life right now, things that, that oppose the word of God, you can change that. You can decide that you're going to hear what God says above what other things are saying. You can choose to hear the word and it alone. And you can choose that any time. So you can clean up your ground. You can remove the tears. You can remove the thorns. If you're, if you're hanging with the wrong people and doing the wrong thing, that doesn't mean you're forever stuck in this rut and that your ground is now the same forever. You can change your ground. 
by removing some of the stuff. And how do you do that? Not by my own efforts, but by saying, okay, I place your word above this. I will value and hear you what you say above what the world says, above what I think or what's being told to me. So 30, 60, and 100 fold is a progressive trust, a perpetuating expansion of the kingdom in my life. In other words, like a farmer, I don't know, maybe not a farmer, because how many of us here are farmers? Okay. But most everybody has planted something, right? And when you planted something, I planted a sunflower. Did anybody ever plant a sunflower? Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but my sunflowers grew just about 7 to 10 inches tall. Until one day, I had a sunflower that was as tall as I was. I don't know why it chose to be the one. But all the other ones were wimpy and awful looking, and this one was awesome. And I was like, this is great. This thing is as tall as I am. I took pictures with it as a child, and I was like, this is my sunflower. One thing I did realize is that that thing must have had about 100 different seeds in the middle of the flower. They were purple, which was a little strange, because when I went to the store, they were black and white. I never could figure out how that got from purple. But apparently, they didn't get a chance to write it or dry out or something. But anyway, there were bunches of seeds in there and I realized, now I could take all those seeds and I could eat them. Or I could take those seeds and I could replant them and get more seeds. But like most children, I would not bother to wait and I just took them all right then. But the idea is 30, 60, and 100 means that there's advances that keep perpetuating because that's the way the kingdom works. You don't just stop and get one time blessing and it rolls throughout eternity. It is a progressive revelation of the word of God that brings more word to you, that brings more word, that brings more seed, that brings more word, that brings more. So you perpetually increase when you give priority to God and what he says above what else is being said or thought. Let's look at what, and again, this isn't because some Christians are awesome and some Christians are just plain old lousy. That's just not the way it is. We have control over our ground that we present to God. We can remove the things that, that hinder the word of God. Did you notice it says there that those things choke out the word and it becomes unproductive. In other words, it could have been productive if you just stopped letting the things that are choking it continue to choke it out. So we can change those things. So let's look then at some one of the key principles while we close this particular part of the chapter up. He goes into another one and right away in verse 21 he says, a lamp is brought uh, he said unto them, is a lamp brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed? Can you give me that answer real quick? No. <laughs> okay. And not to be set on a lampstand? For nothing is hid which will not be manifest, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come into the open. He who has ears, let him hear. Verse 24, take heed what you hear, with the measure that you measure, it will be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. And to him that has shall be given, and to him that has not shall be taken even that which he has. All right, that sounds a little confusing, so let's break it down and close with that. First of all, he's giving us a, a clear indication of how this parable meets where we live. First of thing is, is how do we hear, okay? Hearing is a, is a cornerstone of being able for the kingdom to expand in our lives. When we stop hearing, we stop growing. Everyone say, when we stop hearing, we stop, we stop, hearing. We stop growing. We stop growing. Okay. Because when we have closed off our ears to the gospel or just to the things of God, to the word of God, we have now stopped our growth, our potential to grow. When we stop hearing, we stop growing. So, 
The attitude would be, I never want to stop hearing because I never want to stop growing. But he says, take heed how you hear because the measure that you measure with is the measure that will be measured back to you. All right, what does that mean? If you are willing to measure everything else by what God has said or your commitment to Him. Now, sometimes you don't really have a particular word from God, but you know what God does or does not want you to do. If He said, love your neighbor, and you were tempted to go steal from your neighbor, okay? Taking heed how you hear is to say, I hear what Jesus said about loving my neighbor more than what I hear the devil tell me about how to get what I want from my neighbor. Do you understand the difference? The devil's always going to talk to you. Your mind has been programmed from your past life experience, and it's going to take the word of God to reprogram your mind out of the way it was thinking and into the way it should be thinking, right? And so when you take heed how you hear, if you hear God's word as a priority above hearing what other words and things are said to you, you are now giving God the opportunity to bring increase into your life for the, as far as the kingdom come, is concerned, to bring increase in your life because you have chosen to prioritize what you hear, God's word, above what you hear being said in your mind or being said by others or being implicated by the world around you. Amen? Now you can't help but think about or listen to what has been told to you from the world around you. We live in the world, we're just not of it. But the idea is that that doesn't mean that things from the world aren't going to filter through your life and your thoughts and everything and try to infiltrate you. But we can put a hearing on the Word of God above the things that are being spoken to us in our own minds, from fed to us from our past experiences of the world or current social stigmas or, or pressures of the world in which we live. We can choose to hear the Word first. And so when he says, take heed how you hear, because the measure that you measure with will be measured back to you. In other words, it's, it's hard to imagine that you can measure, you can give God a measurement in which to work in your life. And yet, the scripture indicates that you are able to give God a measurement by which to operate in your life. That is, will you respect his words as a priority above all the other things being said or spoken? In your life. If you prioritize the Word of God, Jesus, your relationship with Him, the message about Him, or a specific word that you have received from Him in the Bible, either way, it's all the Word. But if you will respect that Word, hear what He says above all else, then the kingdom will manifest. It will rise to that level in your life. Because you've made an opportunity for the kingdom to rise to this level. So what I want us to do is just be able to say, okay, where are areas, I mean, we looked at these grounds, you know, have you let some of these things slip or, you know, don't think that that's just a done deal because you, you know, made a mistake in the past or this week or this month or whatever. Have you let certain words rise above the word of God? That's not the end of the story. It's now time to let God's word take precedent over the other words spoken in your life. And when we do that, we are now measuring up. Amen? We're measuring up. And we're giving God the latitude, if you will, to operate big in our lives. So, what can you, what can you turn around that with the, with the honoring of your words to say, God, I believe your word about those things. Have you been diagnosed with something and you're, you're like, well, the doctor said I have this, but you know what? Let's, let's honor God's word. Say, you know what? This is not a sentence for me. This is, not, this is what I've been diagnosed with. This is the symptoms that I've had. 
but I'm going to believe God for your wholeness and health in my life. Because that's what you came to do. He sent his word and he healed me. I can either say, no, I'm sick and I'm, I'm destitute and there's none of hope for me. Or I can say, you sent your word and you healed me. I haven't seen it yet. It hasn't been manifest in my body. But that doesn't change who I'm honoring with my word today. I'm going to honor you with my word. You're my healer. You sent your word. You healed me. Am I going to go to the doctor? If I feel like it. <laughs> but the idea is, you know, where is my word? Whose word am I honoring first? We can do that. Amen? Amen. You know, maybe it's maybe maybe he's been challenging you in your giving. Maybe he's been challenging you, challenging you, you as trusting him to be your source. Maybe you're in between jobs. Maybe there's a, you know new opportunities or something that you're you're like, well, I'm just taking whatever God wants me, whatever whatever I can, and I've not asked God about it. You know, this is a, this is a great opportunity. Say, God, you're my provider. I trust you, and I'm going to say, God, this this job, this situation, this. This scenario is not my source. You are. You're my source. Amen. Amen? Amen. So I don't know how, how to best put your need into the proper application. But I can tell you this. With the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So if we can measure everything by God's word instead of measuring it by how we feel, how we think, or our past experiences. Okay? That happens to everyone. But we can use a different measure, a measure up, that will give us an opportunity to see God rise to this measure. Amen? Amen. Did you get that? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. All right, Father God, I, I just thank you right now that you're just doing something on the inside of us, causing us to measure up, God and uh, giving us the opportunity to use your word as the measure by which we measure all things. Instead of measuring your word by everything else, we can just use your word to measure everything else by and thereby know that you're going to rise to that place where we've measured. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and just quickly, if you closed your eyes during that prayer, I'd like for you to just keep them there just for a moment while I ask this simple question. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I have, like, like you told me earlier, I have been presented with the gospel, I've been presented with Jesus, it just didn't stick, I, you know, I'd like for it to say it had, but I, I, I just know that I, I, I want to make a decision today that will, that will mean a change in my life, and I'd like to offer the opportunity for you here this morning. If you're here and you say, you know what, I, I do believe that Jesus is God's Son, and I believe that He was raised from the dead, I've just not said so with my mouth and believed it with my heart that I do right here and right now. If that's you, could you just look at me and say, you know what, I, I do believe, and I believe and want to confess that. Okay. Let's do that together. Father God, in Jesus' name, I believe that you sent your word. Love sent its best, Jesus, to me. And I receive him. I receive the word. I receive Christ as my Savior. I believe in him, that he died, that he rose, that he lives today. And I confess him with my mouth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right, let's give God a praise offering. Thank you, God, just for doing what you do best. Thank you for being God in our lives. Thank you just now for honoring your word. Thank you, God, that you are right now the only person that we set our focus on, our eyes on. What you say takes precedence over everyone and everything else in our lives. Because you are our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's receive this morning's tithes offerings. And we have time for fellowship. So that's one of the uh, one of the great things to look forward to is a time where we can just kind of get together with God's people and be encouraged. Um,